Welcome to the second coming of Rachel Blau DuPlessis and Nathaniel Mackey, whose February 2015 reading was canceled due to last year's snow blitz. But the delay has made us all that much older and wiser and all the more ready to receive them. And it has given me time to find these lines by Roberto Juarez in his Ars Poetica. He writes, snow has turned the world into a cemetery, but the world already was a cemetery, and the snow has only come to announce it. Like the snow, the serial poem, or long song, is a kind of laboratory of elaboration, which consistently reinvents its and our attention. Far from simply being a technique, seriality in the hands and ears and senses of these esteemed poets is a kind of continuous education, a humbling of the self to the growing, migrating, increasingly echoic whole, a dexterous infrastructure of fixity and flux, of activity and receptivity. If our readers tonight were novelists, maybe they are, uh, the nature of the continuous, I know, I just saw it, but we're just gonna pretend I didn't know. If our readers tonight were novelists, the nature of the continuous might be the evolution of a character or the perpetuation of a plot. But in poetry, when we say seriality, what is the nature of what is being continued? What is rendering the purported period of a book into an ellipse? When we say a person or a people or a tribe, what is the nature of what persists so that we can safely say same while allowing for loss, change, movement, difference? Here to continue these questions and to introduce our two distinct and distinguished guests this evening are Daniel Bouchard, who will introduce Rachel Blau DuPlessis, and Patrick Pritchett, who will introduce Nathaniel Mackey. They are both, I should add, great poets in their own right. Please welcome Daniel Bouchard, who will introduce the first reader. Good evening. The texts are apparitions, haunted by themselves, ghosting the writer wherever she now is. From draft 114, Exerg and Volta. Rachel Blau DuPlessis' poetry career for more than a quarter century was centered on the writing of, the progression of, the evolution of, and the unfolding, and then the refolding of her epic work titled Drafts. Begun in the mid-1980s and completed in 2013, it is a landmark of contemporary poetry whose complex depths are largely unplumbed and the topography of which is uncharted even by many readers whose ears are familiar enough with the names and long works of Pound and Zukovsky, Williams and Notley. Not only familiar, but comfortable with them. A career that was centered on drafts even while it was the as yet unsung tandem career of her other career as a scholar, an educator, and a theorist of poetry, one who explored in books and essays the careers and poetics of multiple other poets, living and not, while thinking through drafts in published essays. Well, what was it then? 115 poems of astonishing variety and complexity. The suggestion of the unfinished made by the title, that these are just drafts, is enticing and deliberate. Drafts as a title echoes Pound's early book, A Draft of 30 Cantos, a relationship that is anything but facile or friendly. In 2004, 18 years into drafts, she paused to write the essay in the middle of a long poem, an exploratory attempt, a sonar attempt, to measure the work to date, to ask what it was, what it wanted, and to project it into the future. She wrote, for the next years, I will have something to do as many poems to write as I have just written. I have stopped to note this moment, for it is, it is a terrible moment, a fearsome moment in which poetry must question itself, testing its complicity with a world turning very bad, very damaging. Our individual subject presences and subjected pretenses have been poured into a new, almost unbearable mold or press by the political choices we must make by the mindfulness we must sustain in the face of controlling anti-secular attacks from outside our country and from within it. Further, we, intellectuals, poets, analysts, professors, 
resistors, feminists, not to speak of women and homosexuals, are quite near to being again constructed as an internal enemy within our own country. To this unsavory set of prospects, Drafts has offered its proleptic suspicion and bitter, hopeful analysis. Ten years later, with the publication of Surge, the collection that held the last 19 poems, Drafts came to a close. And so began a prolific new period of book-length poems written in what seems a rapid rate, interstices, graphic novella, Euridic, Works and Days, four books in the space of a few years, as unique and distinct and apart from drafts as they are to each other. This is the interstitial period, confining the writing to book-length units, occupying a space between. From interstices, a collection of alternating letters and ledgers, to friends and letters of the alphabet, letter one. Dear X, well, just like that, abrupt. It's a letter to you, right now. Certainly, though not without prehistory, a story webbing among packets of letters held with rusty paper clips, found in random files, a territory of prequels, priors. The prehistory of this inter interstitial period are the connections across those in-between spaces, connecting the words, connecting the works together, like the hinges of a triptych that hold actual panels but they may be pipes hidden in the structure, air ducts, permeating wires, crawl spaces for the bookworm or mite. I am inside, am a mite in the letter, a traveler through R, the sense of dark holes tunneling grainy paper. Rachel's poetry makes writing that never quite ends, in fact, is always begin beginning again. As her earlier projects took from what had preceded them, so her current project, Traces, takes or begins again with the prequel that has made its coming into being possible. From draft 87, trace elements. And they say that memory folds over itself, making residue when you least expect it to. These trace elements function like poetry made by standing where you are, patiently watching and listening, patience for the layers in things and words, in systems and syntaxes waiting for the twist or quirk to coalesce and signify and turn and disappear. Please welcome Rachel Blau Duplessis. I am very happy to be here and the first order of business is to thank everyone including the weather Christina Davis, her assistant Mary, my fellow reader Nate Mackey, a long companion in the long poem, and the indomitable and formidable introducers, both good friends. The first poem I'm going to read is from Torx, and it was written, I think, around the same time as the essay that Dan um, just cited from. This is always the great moment when you see whether the poet is going to choke. <laughs> can do that. It was written in around 03, 04, at the time of the one of the Gulf Wars. And it's called Draft 64, Forward Slash. The poem is the foss in which to cower, hunching down by warehouses of power, a sludge-filled ditch where futurists once lay, now backwashed debris, now box store splay. Turbines process hot things and then distribute them, but nothing is what you want. Things no one sees on always on TVs, not fake, but not, as it happens, unprofitable. Lemmings running on the take. So my throat opened like a snake's throat when it faces down its natural food hiding in twigs. And my eyes opened wider, swept by headlights, fast drivers in fat cars. But I could not strike, 
nor take in all that I saw. I had poisoned nothing, hurt nothing by myself, if ever there were such a thing that had a choice apart from strings of stringent, stinging links that I could barely bring myself to know. Standing uneven, a slant in the street, like the corner mutterer covered with a quilt, bloated with poisonous fill. Although my electric other selves did damage where they found they could all in my silly name slash, slash, it was too much to be therefore so close to overcome. I could not do one step at a time, or at least I had to step on many paths at once with too few feet to go around. Content, transfer, encoding, quoted, printable, blank, Rachel, I just wanted to let you know right here by writing this that I too am a stranger in these tangled corridors of strangeness threaded through the buried graffiti and strata, Prussian blue over burnt umber, a glyph of the 20th century. So far, this one too. I limp the maze where other shivering walkers went, the hurt, the halt, the broken. I imp there, am a particular shadow or third beside them, in a classical cadence foregrounded by the habit of hearkening back to what we know, some idea that's so consoling. But I am leaning, I am propped, I am fractured, This is not walking, but a shuffled drag. I am trying to walk in the world as it is, but all the weights and balances are off sides and listed, the whole range of scales, tilts, visionary ankle-twisted trail when I am in this real world pulling a concrete plug or slug my self Whatever it was snapped when I put one heavy-hearted foot down on the concrete, one rancid day of mist or mist. I surely need to learn to walk again mindfully where it is necessary to go. There was ripped cloth and a hollow ring of bone dissolved into a raining snow of my own, my own body falling slowly, swirl and clumps. And I didn't want to know there was nothing I got that I had wanted yet. A little fuzz or droplet indicates its place. There was no solution to continuing to want except continuing. Wind rain of a shallow day, hot fix, but the firewall is, as stated, temporary. So far, there is no fix lasting longer. There's nothing more to say. And so I haunt the spot I once was riding, under the road, under the mall, under the state, under everything, strata engorged and fattening shelves, ghost. Yes, ghost. This one not complex, just the shadow aisle of sunken hope and text. Okay. Okay, at a certain point in one's life and um, in in this project, um, the, there's a moment where you think <laughs> of all sorts of things, and one of them is kind of what you meant to do. <laughs> so the next poem is, um, is called uh, Draft 107, Meant to Say. And um, I could gloss it with a little bit from the preface of Surge. Surge is actually for sale back there. No poem is totally the poem you meant to write, but every poem you've written is the one you could, you did or could write, brought to the poiser level of interest to which you could then bring it. That is, the poem escapes the poem, or the poem escapes the poet, or 
Is it the poem escapes the poetics? With the simultaneity of making and a sense of loss, something escapes inside the work. This escape authenticates the work. Draft 107, meant to say, meant only to list one and one and one wonder, but found I needed verbs, and then I needed time. Meant to note the heavy doors whose weight, without having been there, one can only pretend to intuit. Meant to erase half the words or more, but couldn't bring myself to do it. Wanted to know about making art and telling the truth. Why this engineered apple tastes dull? How did we get here and did we decide to? Or else what flood of slough drowned us where we stood? Meant to make the stitches more overt, patches and their overlap, but aesthetically. Meant to sketch every day and thus note more, much more. So far away from what is called the center, it might as well be here. Question, looking back, what did you learn? Answer, what a small amount of metal it takes to kill you. Meant to say, cost that out. It isn't as if this thought has gotten nowhere. Conjunctures of intensity play, play out as dispersion. So, meant to make a poetics, the way people do, but it never included everything I wanted. Meant to take webbed strings and watch small articulations. Meant more mystery and more humility. What I meant might have been more saturated in the understanding of paralysis. Meant to write biographies of obscure objects and their provenance. What is beyond the sublime? What beyond the old poems with their alarming preponderance of white marble and green travertine? Meant to have spelled Dingedicht correctly, but didn't. <laughs> and now I don't know whether to correct it or not in the other poem, but never mind. The lapis, the amethyst, the turquoise, the soft brown velvet sack, symbols of other gifts, all unspoken, all under acknowledged, never enough questions asked. Depression glass, the carrion crows settling satisfied on roadkill, the white chip off a deep blue bowl from France, tin tea trunk, little toy it was, that kind of thing. You know what I mean, a list of unaccountable items, totally yours. Some are lost, others list, awake of themselves. They send as much forward as they can, but I saw that file only in shreds, meant to get more from it. Meant to mention the poem is always in motion, always moving away is what I meant to say. What I meant was some painful, almost implausible point between being abandoned and what? Assumed into our humanness? This whole era has lived in denial, affirming or sanctioning genocide and destruction. Meant to say, what now? Who is the intermediary for what? I meant to notice. I meant to create the kind of beauty that was not beautiful in the way I did not want. This left me without much of what I was once meant to do, so had to change my mind. <clears throat> meant to keep better records, meant to ask more questions. Coming from time, webbed further in time, to get singed, torn, used up, wrangling, that's what I meant. What does the characteristic feeling of debris and twisted twisting actually say? Meant, I meant to start and to startle myself, it was so. 
trample the vanity of the poem. Do you need this piece of string? I saved it for you for the knot and length to work on. Under, over, twist and let it hold so you could weave it in the webbing that you keep too. It is your archive as well as mine, this little piece of nothing, this part of the imaginary whole. Would it have helped to be less careful or more? I would have liked to understand the choice better. Meant to. Should there be fewer moments of the heightening of art? I meant a greater ambivalence, meant to keep on saying, what do you do this for? And meant to stay in the ungainly spot where too little and too much struggle between an open fright. Meant to finish. Now it is not clear what I meant or what I mean by that, but readiness is right. I meant to let the poem pass into its particular autism, a compound paralysis of overloaded desires. Can one overcome one's own cowardice? Meant to ask this. Plastic no longer means malleable. It means a voluminous tax on the ocean. Trample the vanity of the poem. It is a smudge on the page. If nothing more could walk between the lines, the words I found made other words their interlocutors. Here is the twisted key. What kind of an event is this? Shouldn't all writing be utopian, but also plausible? The failures are ethical, they are rhetorical, they are political. What aren't they? Yet how could I limit the call I made? Ring the bell. <laughs> Ring the bell again. This thing is the only poem you'll ever need, but you'll need it no matter who writes it over and over. So when one writes long poems, there's lots um, of things that are at stake more and more of the things that are at stake get at stake. But um, one, one avatar of all of this is Mallarmé with his strange um, thought that everything in the world is, is intended or meant to end up in a book, <laughs> which is really a weird thing to say. I mean. I've written about this, and I'm not going to give you a lecture, although, you know, hey, you know, you stand here and you start holding forth. But there's something very, very strange about that, and yet it's extremely tempting. So there are also a lot of other reasons for thinking about the book, and um, one is the Zukovskian question that Peter Quartermain once posed so amazingly and comically, as is his wont, at a conference, do you say the, the or the? Do you say a or a? I mean, and I'm not talking about the poem. I'm just talking about the article, the definite and indefinite article. So we have two pronunciations of this in English, which is really weird. Um, other than that, the only thing that you need to know to actually hear this poem is that the word yod is the teeniest Hebrew letter. It actually looks like a comma up on top of things. And the other is that for those of us who make books, typographical errors are always an interesting phenomenon. I mean the stuff that turns up in the book after you're finished and it's printed. And one thing that um, often turns up is the mix up bet between form and from. 
It's the bane of, you know, it's one of the banes of people's existence. <laughs> so that sort of, this poem is written antiphonally, or it has, you know, somebody says something and then another voice says something else in um, italics. Draft 104, the book. There is no actual the book, but it does exist. A book withdraws into itself. A book flakes sometimes, spins, spouts, charges, sputters. Opening yod, its little eye, the book is awake. The book, traveling backward, holds a smaller book, which it is reading. A book is, however, an acceleration, or causes one. A might turn into the book. Only some books turn. A door is a hinge, a book is another. Opening a book is like tripping over a threshold. A book is one gloss of the book. Another book shines in the distance. The book is the ledger of its whole account. Every word adds up the word that never was. Sometimes in a book, even with letters properly spaced, one finds a white rift open down the page. And inside every letter is a tiny, dark book. Sometimes the book falls from your hands. You have entered into its dream. It seems to enter yours. It's about time you talked about the book when you come to think of it. One dark line down the page is not a book, but it could suggest you begin one. A book is the goal, but not just any book. The season was fruitful. There was a book ripening in the furrowed field. If you get thirsty harvesting, suck on a watermark. The book, traveling backward, holds a smaller book, which it is reading. That book holds one smaller still. A is for aura, B is for book. I loved, he put, tried to put a lemon in the book because it wouldn't fit. A book in time saves nine, but rarely. <laughs> this sequence traveling backward, sorry, travels backward until the last thing visible is a dot. That dot is also a book. Inside the alphabet, a library. A book can be indistinct. The book is also. Foreground syntax, entering the book. Decry syntax, escaping the book. Write your book on the underside of another book. A real book is a stone room. You write your book, I'll write mine. A book is surely the birth of an enigma. Some book. The book hinged, open and closed, as if the letters touching read the words, the words, the text. So do not shut the open book. If A is for aura and B is for book, what is C? For three, three, the rivals. A book is a cut of several colors with warp threads hanging from it. A book is a swirl of syntax written in light, spinning secularly. It is a doll book and the book of the universe. It whispers days, this book. The house was quiet and the book 
was calm. Which is the book? Which is the gloss? The the of the book is a tricky concept, but one doesn't just want a. There is a big I in the middle of the book. It does not blink first. This is it. This is the book. Yet really, don't be delusional. Finally, it is all related, but it does not cohere. A book notices. It looks out at you. It's true that this book might finish. It's true it might go on. What a book. It snarls the translucence, full impasto ahead. The page is slowly turning black. The revulsion to a book, the attachment to the book, totally explicable. Each sibyl syllable is made of darkening lightness. Ah, the darlings. This is the from of the book. Not its structure, but its from. Its exodus. And the last thing I'm going to read, which is sort of a little bit of an homage to Nate, uh, as the first poem contained one line that had been in a poem that, I, that was dedicated to you in the, yeah. Um, for, the la for my last act, I will um, read only the very, very end of the, that is the 14th section of the last poem in drafts. Draft. It's draft 114. The ambiguity of the numbers is explained in the preface to this book, which is available in fact. No, I'm kidding. Um, we, uh, Dan, Dan said 115, and I said 114, and there's a, um, there are some reasons for that. Um, there's an unnumbered poem in the middle. But the draft 114 is called Exurg and Volta. And in this very short section, um, compared to what I just read especially, there are citations from Robert Duncan, Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, and Nate Mackey. Okay. All right. That this began, that this ends. That this refused to begin, though it started. That it refuses to end, though it is folding itself up. We offer a full spectrum of services going round into an imagined endlessness, endlessly overwritten. The page is stamped in saturated black in which the last lines herein placed are thus unreadable, hidden within a glossy square of ink. It is finished, but it is not complete. Is black all colors, or was that white? I am not sure that this is not the end. So that, or simply so, going backwards through the work's own vibrato, it is 4.32 a.m. exactly. In the wind that's blowing fiercely, there are so many tasks to start up again, like this, the is, the it, it est. So, vector the crossroads once again. Volta, volta. Thank you. Hello, everyone. 67 years ago, <clears throat> a little bit of history for you, the first Bollingen Prize was awarded to Ezra Pound amid a wee spot of controversy. 
That very same year, however, 1948, Robert Duncan wrote the Venice poem. <clears throat> in imaginary instructions, the third section of that poem, he deliberately echoes a footnote by Pound to Fenelos's The Chinese Written Character as a medium for poetry. And I quote, the duration of the syllables, the melodic coherence, the tone leading of the vowels. I take these lines by Duncan to be key to the work of the Bollinger's latest recipient, Nathaniel Mackey, whose intricate melodies and sinuous improvisations weave the sonic chords of the Mystic Horn Society, blowing some way-gone, deep-toned, weary, messianic blues. <clears throat> Beginning in 1985 with the publication of Eroding Witness, Mackey has undertaken an extraordinary adventure into the expansion of the possibilities of the vowel as an instrument for committing poetry. Specifically, the serial poem, whose resources our other reader tonight, Rachel Blau du Plessis, has also so richly and extensively amplified. As Robin Blazer puts it, the serial poem, quote, refuses to adopt an imposed storyline. I like to describe to describe this in Ovidian terms as a Carmen perpetuum, a continuous song. In Mackey's work, seriality becomes a form of verbal jazz driven by a desire, as John Coltrane put it, to keep going until you fit it all in. Wayne Shorter once spoke of Coltrane's poetics as a way, quote, to speak the English language backwards, and not really in a playful way. It was like to speak backwards, to get at something else, to break patterns. Throughout his career, Nate Mackey has been breaking patterns and reforming them, expanding the range of what a poem can do, of how we think of the po work of poetry itself. Lyrical in address, <clears throat> while epic in scale, Mackey has created that rarest of things, a long poem that is intimate, that places the stress as much on the tone leading of the vowels as the larger architectural design. Pound strove to write a long poem containing history. Its failure, alas, was ensured at the outset by its totalizing ambition. The luminous detail went astray amid a dark wood. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't resist. Uh, Duncan's approach to the long poem made a crucial swerve to write two intertwining serial poems, structure of rhyme and passage, neither with an end, each making inquiries into myth as much as history. Above all, they made the act of writing itself integral to the poem's unfolding. All these tributaries and more run through the work of Mackey, his ongoing parallel series, Mu and Song of the Andambulu, to say nothing of his epistolary novels gathered under the title From a Broken Bottle, Traces of Perfume Still Emanate, treat poetry as a process of continual revision. Far from being episodic, Mackey's long poems have plot lines, characters, dialogue even. Uh, his jazz players are forever on the road, Orphic orphans of the highways, fueled to their next gig by the migratory strains of Eros, the blood vibe of Lorca's Duende. The thing about serial poems that makes it messianic is that it's always arriving, always on the way, always deferring its conclusion. Dear Angel of the Dust, Mackey writes, in last night's poem, which I've yet to write, the two of us were singing in some distant church. The poem, like jazz, is always diasporic, always emerging or about to emerge from dream, in route, provisional, fugitive, searching, forming, then reforming. Mackey's twin cycles begun in eroding witness and continuing through School of Udra, What Said Seraf, Splay Anthem, Nod House, and most recently, Blue Fossa, build a recursive and intertwined network of Dogen mythology, oniric shamanic trance, and a messianic poetics derived from the jazz of Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, Pharaoh, Sandros, Pharaoh Sanders, and Don Cherry, to name a few. Poems like Song of the Andambulu, and drafts too, I might add, are, are never really over. They possess a Mobius-like quality of bounded fin infinitude. Such poems can never be finished because they are always in conversation with the promise of the poem yet to come. The only response to a poem is another poem. As Mackey notes in his preface display anthem, seriality's mix of utopic ongoingness and recursive 
constraint is blue topic, incantatory insistence is liturgy and libation. Utopic ongoingness, there's a powerful ethical dimension in the messianic serial poem. By refusing closure, it op holds open the door to the excluded and the marginal. It places a focus on how meaning gets constructed rather than packaged. Mackey's prose interlocutor, The Angel of the Dust, takes the long road to one more site of exile, one more lonesome solo, one more note, not the final note, but the one still to come. His notion of discrepant engagement creates a productive estrangement, one from which the lost mythic continent of Mu emits its bass tone, its perpetual ahum, as Mingus might put it, a poetry of logophanic promiscuity, generating a Gnostic erotic swing. Uh, dig it, people. I mean, uh, this is real. Celebrating the ongoing and the going on. The Dogen wobble, the creaking of the word, the stutter step vocable of what the priestess utters as she strips off her next to last umbra and sings us into trance. Please welcome to Harvard the master of Vatic scat, Nathaniel Mackey. <laughs> Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Patrick. <laughs> Oops, my man. It actually reminds me of uh, the story of, uh, the early part reminded me of the story of um, one night John Coltrane was uh, in some club listening to Wayne Shorter when he was a member of the Jazz, uh, the jazz Messengers, Art Blakey's group. And, and he was rather new on the scene, and uh, some, some of the folks that uh, Coltrane was sitting next to in the back of the room, I guess back at the bar, couldn't quite get to what he was doing. And, and one of them said, oh, man, that, that just sounds like scrambled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and Train said, yeah, but listen to the way he scrambles them. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I've always heard that is relevant to the serial poem. Um, you know, recursiveness, scramble, uh, anagrams, things like that that come into my work, you know, have a lot to do with scrambled eggs, which um, is a dish I, I do like. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Christina for inviting me to read and uh, all the folks here. Um, it's great to read with Rachel. Um, I feel like our two uh, long poems are, are, are kind of cousins. Um, she calls hers drafts. Uh, I write Song of the Andumbulu, and I describe the Andumbulu as a rough draft of human being. Uh, so this, this, this emphasis on the provisional and the, the imperfect and the ongoing is something we both share. I'm going to uh, start with um, and maybe not get past this uh, new chapbook uh, that came out recently. It's called Moments Omen, and it's um, um, some further installments of uh, Mu and the Song of the Andumbulu. There's this quote from George Lamming, a great West Indian novelist um, that I've always liked. And I used it as an epigraph uh, to the chap book. It's from one of his later novels, um, Natives of My Person. Uh, he says, or one of the kids, well, no, he says, the narrator says, to be alive was to be warned. There's a poem in here that I guess you'd call it the title poem, uh, the way we used to do back at radio uh, when we were talking about uh, pieces off of a of an album or a CD. Uh, it's Song of the Andumbulu 142. And it's, uh, some of these have subtitles or have titles. And, and this one is called Moments Omen. Uh, among other things, I, I, I couldn't get over the fact that moment in, includes the word omen. Um, let's say it's a, omen is a, a scrambling out of moment. The, um, 
I think I was more surprised that, than anyone that um, these poems developed into something that had a kind of line going through it that had to do with travel and a group of well, what I guess you could call characters uh, developed who are in these various vehicles traveling. And here's a, uh, this one is a, an installment that um, features that whole travel business. Um, they start off on a train. Uh, it's, a, it's a poem in which a figure uh, pops up. Um, I think of her as a, a mix of the flamenco dancer, Carmen Amaya, and most, some of you know that flamenco is a big deal with me. Um, a mix of, of Carmen Amaya and uh, Rosa Parks. We were on a train somewhere on our way to California. Florida, Panama, and the Bahamas lay behind. Abandoned boys and girls again, the band of us. We threw our votes toward the to polling place, too far away to reach. Southern arrest had set in. We set our sights west. Sunset's chemical sky, some new recognizance, bomb the omen's notice might be. Lone coast obliquity said, come hither. Steeped in solvency, bittersweet obliquity, bend. Fit were at the end of it, but not. Lone coast arrivancy, lone coast obliquity's behest. We had just gotten started. We were barely off. A dream of outmost arrival obliged us. The asymptotic hustle it was, notwithstanding. A blessing we were bent on, boon beyond any. Lone coast rapprochement. Either we stood in a line wrapped around the world, or we sat on a train headed west. IDs in see-through ink. Either way, we circumambulated, unsure which. The ballot box our Kaaba stone, black rock. No way to look through or look into it. No matter it lay broken or because it lay broken, come from no sky we knew. We were scared and afraid fear meant we knew something. Scared being scared was knowing's omen, moment's gnosis. The alone lay waiting, the we we were, we were afraid we'd be. I knew there was no we. I knew I knew we less than we's rumor. I knew it was a feeling from before. I knew there was the hum it made at least. I snuck a peek at where the alone were, lone coast and taglio, a grimace in the wind. The it of it might only be the hum of it I saw, heard what it made me imagine I saw, and a grieved amen we were a moan away from. Why they take it away? Why they try to, we were asking. A lady dressed in black stood in the aisle and started dancing. Otherwise we sat with refugee bank otherwise we sat with refugee blankets tossed over us, flags we later learned of the possessed. Why we the had we were asking, wanting more to think of an earlier life, some lifted sense, something said getting out of a car when we were nineteen. So it was, and so it went. So we said and saw it come true. Disposition, dispossession got hold of us, possessed us, got us happy. Lone coast abandoned, woven into the blankets we wore. Now it was a bus we were on, going backwards. No matter, we sat in front. Where was the ballot box, we were asking? Where did they put it? We soon saw the way, the fey design of it away from Lone Coast while on it, none of us knowing where, none of us knowing when. We were in the aisle now, the lady in black, our leader, Lone Coast Islander, she intimated, come hither, gave the air a bump with her hips and gave it a grind. Give it all a don't care damn, we took her to, to mean. 
She was the moment's woman, frustration's main squeeze. Given to paradox, don't care damn, we gave it up to. All of us only there not knowing why, she made us admit. She took it from juke to flamenco before we could blink. Back stiff, head and chin high, heels hammers, face rationing pride and duress. Eyes elsewhere, her hands bore mudras, a sign from the east, it seemed. Don't care, damn, a danced indifference. Dance, don't cares, ta wheel. Heels hit the floor. We'd had enough. The lady in black's heels hit and ours followed. Heels hit the floor on the bus that had been a train, the bus that again was a train when our heels hit. A Websterian growl went up as they hit, Conte Hondo's friend. A breathy reed squawk behind each of us, a kundalini black snake moan. A buttress it seemed it was in back of us. Gravelly strafe Camarón would have blown had he blown a horn. Thus it was we spoke of clowns and kings, each of us conducting our lone apocalypse. Nature Boy, before we knew it, was on the box that wasn't there. Instead, we spoke with our feet. An early joy relived in a dream came next. Lone coast reconnaissance, dreamt of in Teleki, hinted what a rival might be. Slogan. What it was was dance was a weapon for the weaponless. Would be, some would have said. It wasn't some next level stuff. We'd have none of it. A way of being a way that brought out in was all it was. Frown line, frown line amenity, a wrinkle in the wind. Noses up as though we took offense. What it was was we did take offense. Ballot box absconditi afoot, no one would not have. Deep song dances hauteur was no shuffle. All heel was what it was, all stomp. I'm going to read a long one. <laughs> I, uh, the last time I was at Harvard, the first time I was at Harvard, uh, I was actually here in the late 60s as a member of the Pr Princeton track team. Um, I was a pole vaulter. My event has changed to the long jump. <laughs> Um, yeah, Lone Coast Recension. Yeah, I'm going to read this. You know, you, get, you write these poems and they're long and you never read them, you know. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to read this one. It, you know, I may, I may blow the rest of my time on it, but, you know, you know got to do it. Um, as I've said, um, these uh, people show up in these poems. Uh, <laughs> and um, and I, I don't really know much about them, I have to admit, but um, I, I find out more about them as I write. Um, Sophia's been around for a long time, and um, I think she appeared in the 80s. Uh, evidently, she's written a book. Called, the, called Lineaments of When. And um, Itamar is a more recent um, um, fellow traveler. Um, and um, this, he came in, gee, in the 90s, I think. Um, but he's kind of front and center here. Um, and then this dialogue thing that Patrick mentioned. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I liked Plato when I when I was in in, in high school. So maybe <laughs> maybe one of my early influences coming through. Um, Lone Coast Recension, and what Rachel was saying about the book. Uh, it's almost as though she knew I was going to read this. Um, uh, this this thing about Mallarmé. Uh, 
I agree with Mallarmé. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, you know, it, do, you know it, it don't mean a thing if it, you know, doesn't make it into a book. <laughs> 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 you know, so, you know, and uh, it, it may be weird, but you know, some of us just feel that way. You know, that's, that's, as Bobby Womack would say, that's the way I feel about it. Um, so anyway, um, you tomorrow, and uh, you tomorrow wants to talk about is talking about this book, uh, Lineaments of When, When, W H E N. Itamar stood brooding, overlooking the bay. The art of time he'd been getting good at suddenly lost in its low harmonics. I was his main man, he was saying, had been since we met in Brazil. He'd been reading Sophia's lineaments of when, Sophia's whose hard looks he loved, his magus, rough bay water thought's mantle, his at her behest. The arc and the ailment of when, the gist of it, mused upon grab the grade of it, whose or of whom we debated, wondering which. His and her platonic dialogue had re-begun. We leaned on the rail, looking out where gray water met gray sky. The self-consuming soma the book touched on, we talked about. Itamar asking, how could that have been? Damned if I know. I shrugged. Gulls blown out to sea, blown featherless, it seemed. Something caught in the batting of an eye. The lineaments of when, the book said, such that Dram ran as one with Drinker, the psychotropic lord of that realm, the realm itself. How could that have been, Itamar kept asking. Damned if I know, I again went on. Damned if I know. I again went to say, but I bit my tongue, the gulls blown out to sea having blown back in, fully feathered again. Block body, block gyration, nod auspice, Itamar's mantic body, sophic book. He was turning as he talked, a slow dervish, arms out away from his body, hands hanging, wrought fingers working the air for what the book meant combed air, cracking the code. I thought to take a step away, get a better look. No step there to be taken, it turned out, so tight my legs were. Blown gull epiphany too much, it turned out. Feathered, unfeathered, refeathered, more than I could take. Gray day, gray auspice we disquisited underneath. Itamar's belated Q&A with Sophia's book, Book he knew inside out he argued with. Book he stood a student of. There we stood, him whirling toward the water, thin rail holding him back. I leaned on the rail recalling what I could of Sophia's book, self-imbibing Soma the least exact of what, I, of what came to me. Gray eminence the water and sky were adjunct to. Mind set and setting run as one, some clue I missed. I told myself the title again and again. The lineaments, the mystery of when seemed only obvious. Too true it could only do as it was, the one thing I remembered. Announcing which caught Itamar's ear. He stopped whirling. What? I fell back on insisting on the it of it, the ease of so putting it, off-putting, I recognized. The it of it, I said, is what? The it, the is of it. That's what she was getting at. A vulgarity of sorts, Itamar called it. Spit like froth on the waves tumbling in. The is of its correlative, he explained. We stood on the fringe of the habitable world. The sea and the sky were gray matter. Gulls wore optional feathers. So it was we leaned looking out, stood leaning. The rail held us up. A tenuous foothold it was we were on. Talk took us there, I wanted to say, but he beat me to it. A vulgarity we can't afford, he said. This or that is, 
this or that it of it, yours or Sophia's either way. It wasn't what I'd have said. It wasn't what I went to say. I meant in some other way to say we'd gone too far. Talk took us there, I said. The book took us there. The book took us in, I might well have said. The spit-like froth kept rumbling in. The spit-like froth, the spit-like froth kept tumbling in, a kind of cosmic reproach, it seemed. The gulls blew out and blew back in and blew back out, feathered, unfeathered, refeathered again and again, right above where the Capoeira class had been. Whatever the mood was had come over everything. We were all in, in it, of it, the in and the of of it, spooked by Sophia's book, the lineaments of when, nowhere if not there, the lineaments of where, never if not then. I saw it in my eye's eye. I saw it in my heart of hearts. Itamar put his hand on his chest as if taking an oath, struggling to hold himself up. He tossed his head back and squawked a seagull's cry. He was in the early morning cups he called music. No lala came out, but it might as well have. A tossed bird's aria, a shaken bird's etude. I heard it with an ear athwart hearing, heard it in my heart of hearts. All of all outdoors chimed in. The air squawked in solidarity. Gray sky, spit like spume. I heard something at the same time subsquawk. Blown lifted wing, blown lifted feather, a sound exacting the play of light on wood, gray day no matter, lone coast luminescence, lone coast buff. Fleck turned full surface, it to Mars burnished recall. I saw with my eyes, ears, eye, he was Itamar, whose main man I was, Itamar, Sophia's pupil, whose book he drew back from. I heard with my eyes, ears, ear, it was she in whose cabin honey went granular. Nets and nets she might have been. It all so slipped and slid. I saw with my ears, eyes, eye, he was a fool for knowledge, wisdom's idiot, a gull I could look in the eye. With my ears, eyes, ear, I heard, with my ears, eyes, ear, I heard Joao Bosco, Califada, Giquimeras. With my eyes, ears, ear, I heard Georgie Ben, Hermes Trismegistu, Escrivail. All the elements joined in, eroded witnesses left and right. I saw we were caught in the moment, hostages, the lineaments of winds, putative witness worn away. My eyes, ears, eyes, audition. It all had fallen under arcane tutelage, the Bosco and the Ben threaded in threaded in, all but inaudibly, the moment so dexterous we stood in the book itself. The eucalyptus trees turned gray. In my ears, ears, eye, I saw them dance. In my ears, eyes, eye, I saw them incubate gray and silver, gray but with color, in concert with the sky, the reed again, one with the rush. Itamar's moment's dexterity, so of the end of it, vulgate, bind, and redoubt. Den and redoubt. To speak with Itamar overlooking the beach was to find an eye or an ear, possessing an eye or an ear, possessing an eye or an ear, the true two messens of when. Sophia's delight was to be of the book, he said, his too to be of it, only not as much. She it was, he said, whose walk lit the way, wherefore the book, roost, beauty, recompense insufficient, even so. To be lit was to burn slowly, a blister welling up, the is or the it, the ooze of it, vulgate rub and release, a vulgarity of sorts he'd say every now and then. The phrase came loose from what it was, stuck to it first. An ictic insolence, the more he repeated it, the thing whose name it was, if it named anything. A vulgarity of sorts, he all but spat, 
consonant with the waves tumbling in. He went back to the book, but came away from it, back as though the break were the book, which it was. Where was it, if not in a break, we stood, I wondered, herons and egrets lifting up from the marsh nearby, reeds and the like right at the water's edge. Where was it, I rhetorically asked. The low rung of the river lay to our right, falling seaward. No way to be where we were, unalloyed. Broken water, collapsed hatch, fallen rung, sunken lock, flank we were shadowed by. Wherefore the book, there being more than one where, would be containment, step falling out from under. There we stood on the next rung down, dust on our feet from the summer, step we stood abreast of, caroling more than one win. The tumescence of wind was our book outside the book, a see-through hymnal we sang from, was dust in our throats. The tumescence of wind was part Philomena, part filler, a book we coughed our thro throats out reading from. Thus the tawil he worked, sublime substrate, sublime substrate, query, quibble, quirk, platonic two-step, a vulgarity of sorts, titrated, sublime sulfate, lexemes lined in a row. He, recollect, he recollected the log he'd sat on hatching balloons toward the back of the beach, the grain of Sophia's neck, hand, face, the closing up of wind, a dry succulent, a pressed ice plant, a stain on the page. To what end I wasn't sure except to say it had hold of him, Lone Coast recension, a kind of pixie dust, breathy book his wish blew through. Lit precipitate, something a smile brought to light, something the sun, outdone, backed away from. Lit remnant, the new epiphany, gray day, gray water, gray sky. He said it was the book of being there. He called it the book of having been there there but for looking on, and also by looking on, there but not all there, no matter where, wherefore the book. Sophia sat him down, he said, her book sat him down. Sat him down on the learner's bench, he said, sat him down on a rotting log. Sat him down on a smooth round rock, he said, sat him down on a rock hard zazen pillow, sat him down on what felt like a throne. Itamar was a ghost haunting the spot on the beach where he'd met Sophia, the house they'd eaten couscous in, the cliff the capoeira class practiced on. They'd lain in the sand one night, bored but for the book that came after, a lighting up as latency rose, a lightening up, hot stuffy room the world had become. Clothes on, off, on, platonic either way, knowing what wasn't might not suffice, each toward the other's loins bouquet, there they'd lain, blasé. This the taunt song running through them as they lay. Slogan. It wasn't what he thought it was, no matter what he thought it was, a ravenous ghost gorging on crumbs. Sand mixed in, no matter. Salt mixed in, good as gold, sweet savor. It wasn't what he thought it was. A swing or a swell, sweet riches not so rich, all not lost likewise. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't get to all this. I said I didn't get a chance to get to all this, but uh, you know. <laughs> uh, invite me back. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll bring my pole. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Action.
actually, uh, I meant to say, or I meant to semi-sing, semi-say, uh, happy birthday to this gentleman a few days ago, and to a woman in the audience, Heather Tressler. So we're going to sing. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Ring your bell. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Nate and Heather. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. There are books in the back and food as well, so please hang around. <laughs>